All right, hello, day two of my video updates. Um, today we're gonna be talking about chapters one and two of Great Expectations. So I hope you have your book and I hope it's in better condition than mine. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out about the book is take a look at the contents on the cover. So we have a wedding cake, but there are spider webs on it. That's strange. A lot of gold, um, plates and cups so this seems to be an elegant table setting but something's gone wrong it hasn't been touched in many years on the back you'll see a big old spider right there um, sort of dark gloomy colors in addition to faded white so just keep that in mind as we read that seems to be pretty thematic um, and we'll see and understand the source of that coming up in a few chapters but for chapter one if you'll follow along with me um, Ideally, you've already read it, okay? These videos that I'm gonna post will not explain absolutely everything. You're gonna have to read as well. Um, but we are introduced to our main character, Pip, okay? And the first paragraph says, my fa father's family name being Pirup and my Christian name, Philip, my infant tongue could make bo of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So I called myself Pip and came to be called Pip. So he gives himself his name. He names himself because he couldn't pronounce Philip Pirup, all right? On your character chart, <laughs> um, we're going to be keeping track of how the names are symbolic. So Pip actually is a noun that means a small seed. And if you remember from my video yesterday and the handout that I posted online, um, this novel is a Bildungsroman, a coming-of-age novel. And so think about that. What is a small seed likely to do? It's going to grow, okay? Uh, Pip is not only our main character, but he's also our narrator. So older Pip is reflecting, I'm at school right now, <laughs> older Pip is reflecting back on younger Pip, okay? And so he has that sagacious, reflective air in his narration that younger Pip, the main character, doesn't exhibit yet, obviously. Um, okay, so Pip's earliest memory is hanging out in a graveyard. Um, he talks about how he was, you know, in the, in looking at the tombstone and Mrs. Joe Gargery is his sister who married the blacksmith. And he, he never got to see pictures of his family because it was before photographs. Um, and that parenthetical on page one is indicative of the older narrator reflecting back. So by the time the older narrator is telling the story, there have been photographs. Uh, and little Pip is so curious and sweet and innocent. Remember, this is his innocent stage. He imagines what his parents are like based on the font of the tombstones. So it says, the shape of the letters on my father's grave gave me an odd idea that he was a square, stout, dark man with curly black hair. And the character in turn of the inscription, also Georgiana, wife of the above, I drew the childish conclusion that my mother was freckled and sickly. He thinks his mom's name is also Georgiana, wife of the above, the whole thing. Um, he doesn't realize until later that her name's just Georgiana. And so that shows Pip's innocence, but also Pip's pretty smart if he can read and nobody ever taught him, if he can make these inferences without any help. Um, but it's sad too, because besides his two parents who are dead, he's an orphan. Um, there are five stone lozenges, each about a foot and a half long, which were arranged in a neat row, and they were sacred to the memory of five little brothers of mine who gave up trying to give, get a living exceedingly early in that universal struggle. So he's lost his whole family. Whatever wiped out his family, maybe it was the coronavirus of the 1830s, <laughs> just kidding, it's too soon, um, but maybe, uh, you know, it shows that Pip is a survivor. He's tough. He, whatever killed everybody else didn't kill him. And unfortunately, he's had to now be raised by his horrible, mean sister. And so he's hanging out, um, you know, on this, on these misty marshes. It's real, it's a coastal town named Kent, and it's really close um, right to the ocean, okay? And we find out his brother's names are Bartholomew, Abraham, Tobias, Roger, etc. cetera. Um, and he's just shiver, shivering and scared in the graveyard. And then here comes this super scary guy. Hold your noise! I'm on page two. Cried a terrible voice as a man started up among the graves and at the side of the church porch. Keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat. Well, this is convict number one, okay? He's wearing all gray. Um, he doesn't have a hat on. He's torn up. And little Pip is terrified. And he says, oh my gosh, don't cut my throat. And he says, tell me your name, Pip, you know, show me where you live. And he points to the village. And of course, the man is like, well, um, is your family still alive or whatever? Where's your mother? And Pip points to the grave. And he's like, oh, 
and that's your father along with your mother. Yes, sir. And he's like, hmm, okay. So he realizes Pip's alone, um, but he's so hungry. He takes Pip and he flips him upside down, okay? And when the church came to itself, or it was so sudden and so strong, I saw the steeple under my feet. And when the church came to itself, I said, um, the man was eating the bread rav ravenously. So this guy's super hungry. He's just escaped from jail. Um, and he flips Pip upside down, literally, and as we'll find out, figuratively. This moment wouldn't have been mentioned at the very beginning of the novel if it weren't going to be pivotal later. Um, so this convict who has a big old iron leg, um, you know, I just imagine like a boot of sorts with chains and, and he somehow escaped with that thing on. He, um, he demands food, which is whittles and a file. And it's not like a small nail file, but like a big file that'll cut metal. And when he finds out that, you know, Joe Gargery is the blacksmith, then he's going to have that metal tool. And so he says on page four, he says, you bring me those whittles, you bring me the file, you bring them both to me. And he keeps tilting Pip up, upside down or I'll have your heart and your liver out. So he threatens him, scares the poor boy, and Pip just starts running. Um, but he turns back on page five. Um, and it's interesting. Here is our convict. And we're going to keep track of him, of course, on the character chart. You know, these are in the order in which they appear. Uh, and I'll, I'll upload this online so you can see it. But he is associated with water. Okay? And that's really interesting. So when you look at the idiosyncrasies, just the little things about him, convict number one is associated with water. Listen to this on page five. He says, I wish I were a frog or an eel going towards the river. And he dropped into the marshes here and there, stepping in places where the rains were heavy or the tide was in. So this convict is just totally fine with the water, okay? And he looks back again, and the man was limping on as if he were the pirate come to life. So just kind of an interesting simile there. Keep your eye on that. The fact that this dude is associated with water is pretty important. So chapter two, this would have been a pop quiz question had I seen you today. Um, well, like, yeah. So, what day is it in the novel? Okay, always pay attention to dates. The answer, Christmas Eve. Okay, so imagine Christmas Eve and you're hanging out in the graveyard, okay, and you encounter this ex-con. It's just really terrifying. It's not, it's not the homey, warm feeling you want to have. Um, so, Pip returns home and Mrs. Joe's not there because she's been out looking for Pip and she's mad. Um, an idiosyncrasy for Mrs. Joe would be how she always complains about having to raise you by hand, meaning she's had to do this by herself. She's not happy about um, the responsibility of having to raise Pip. And by contrast, Joe, he is such a nice guy. So listen to these descriptions. Joe, I'm on page six, was a fair man with curls of flaxen hair on each side of his smooth face. He was mild, good-natured, sweet-tempered, easygoing, and foolish. He's a dear fellow, a sort of Hercules in strength and also in weakness. We're going to love Joe. He's such a good guy. He loves and helps take care of Pip, but he's kind of dumb. He reminds me of Boxer from Animal Farm. You know, he's so sweet, but not really bright. And so um, he and Pip are almost like brothers, even though there's probably a 20-year age difference between them and their brothers-in-law, you know. But they're like, they're like almost equals. But then Mrs. Joe, she had black hair and eyes and a prevailing redness of skin, I used to wonder whether it was possible she washed herself with a nutmeg grater instead of soap. So her face is raw, um, she's tall, she's bony. Idiosyncrasy, she's always wearing an apron, and there are needles that stick out of the apron that might fall on the bread when you're eating, and you might bite into a, a needle, so that's great. Um, so Joe and Pip, it's, it, there's an interesting contrast here. Our convict has just escaped from jail, and we find out that those are the hulks, which are the prison ships off the coast, okay? Joe and Pip are also prisoners of Mrs. Joe. So there's some sort of implicit parallel between the convict and between Pip and Joe. Page seven, Joe and I were fellow sufferers, having confidences as such. The moment I raise the latch of the door and he says, oh, Mrs. Joe's been out looking for you, Pip. And she's out again, making it a baker's dozen. And uh, when Mrs. Joe comes in, she's carrying something called the tickler, okay? Let me pause. All right. The tickler. <laughs> so the tickler ironically does not tickle. It's a wax ended piece of cane worn smooth by collision with my tickle frame. It's a, an abuse device. It's something that Mrs. Joe uses to smack the crap out of Pip. Um, 
And so she comes in at the bottom of page seven and Pip's been hiding behind the door and she whips him to grabs him and throws little Pip. Remember, he's only seven to Joe and Joe like holds him. I'm on page eight now. And she says, where have you been? And he says, oh, I was at the churchyard. And he says, churchyard. This is Mrs. Joe. If it weren't for me, you would have been to the churchyard long ago and stayed there. Who brought you up by hand? Pip says, you did. And why did I do it? I'd like to know. I'd never do it again. I know that. She's the worst. She wishes Pip were just dead, you know? Um, anyway, so she cuts out bread and butter. And but here we Pip have... remembers that that convict wants some food. And so he's going to take that slice of bread and throw it down his pants. Um, and so I resolved on page nine to put the hunk of bread and butter down the leg of my trousers. And... Joe and Pip, remember, they're like almost equals, right? They eat the bread and they usually spend their times at meals just trying to keep the peace and keep themselves entertained. So they'll have like food eating contests where Joe will eat a bite and Pip will eat a bite and they'll compare the size of their bites while, you know, Mrs. Joe's doing whatever. Um, and so when Joe's not looking, he throws the bread down his pant leg. And on page 10, Joe thinks that he swallowed the whole thing without chewing it. And he starts freaking out. And he says, Pip, old chap. That's something Joe calls Pip all the time, old chap. So we'll write that down as an idiosyncrasy. He says, you'll do yourself a mischief. It'll stick somewhere. You can't have chawed it, Pip. And, and Mrs. Joe hates not knowing what's going on. She says, what is it? What is it? And by this time, my sister was quite desperate. So she pounced on Joe, grabbed him by his whiskers, and banged his head against the wall behind him while I sat in the corner looking guiltily on. So Mrs. Joe's not only abusive to Pip, she's abusive to her husband. What? Uh, anyway, so he says, oh my gosh, Joe says, but such a most uncommon bolt is that. Bolt means throwing the food down without swallowing it. Page 11, and Mrs. Joe says, been bolting his food, has he? Joe says, you know, old chap, I bolted myself when I was your age, a frequent, and as a boy, I've been among a many, many bolters, but I never seen your bolt an equal yet, Pip. It's a mercy you ain't bolted dead. <laughs> it's just funny, you know, this whole thing. So Mrs. Joe has a yet another idiosyncrasy, tar water, tar mixed with water. That can't be good for you. Um, but she makes Pip drink a pint and she makes Joe, who did nothing but drink a half a pint. Um, it's just her medicinal solution to this. Um, anyway, so that night, as I said, it's Christmas Eve and they're, they're sitting down and they're hearing, um, some guns go off and actually two cannons go off indicating that there have been two convicts escaped from the hulks, the prison ships. And Pip's asking a lot of questions about it. Um, and Mrs. Joe's the worst, you know, she says, listen, these are the people who are putting the hulks because they murder and they rob and they forge and they do all sorts of bad. And they always begin by asking questions. So go to bed. In other words, you're next, Pip. Like this young kid needs that guilt. So he goes to bed that night. He makes me think of Harry Potter. You know, he's not even like allowed a candle up there. Um, and he can't sleep. And of course, remember the next morning, it's going to be Christmas day. What kind of Christmas will this be? Uh, but as soon as the first glimmer of dawn shows, he comes down, he robs the pantry, um, and he steals bread, cheese, a jar of mince meat, some brandy, and he pours the brandy out of a, of a, a decanter. Um, so just be ready for that. Uh, some other stuff, some pork pie. And then he goes into Joe, Joe's forge, which is his blacksmith shop and, um, grabs the file. And then he sprints off to the misty marshes. So we're left on a cliffhanger here, um, and that's where I'm going to stop today. Stay tuned. If you can, I'm going to take a picture of this, and I want you to fill in your character chart so that it matches mine, okay? Keep up with all of this. There's going to be tests on it, and I don't want you to get behind, so don't think you can do this all in one night, all right? Bye.